There is, there has been more fallout from the New York Times' uh, misreporting, uh, fraudulent reporting um, about uh, so-called mass rapes. And we've previously talked about Jeffrey Gettleman, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, who is the lead reporter on this atrocity propaganda hoax alleging mass rapes. But in recent days, there's been intense scrutiny of his co-authors on that piece, Anat Schwartz and Adam Sella. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion about that. Yeah, what are we learning about Anat Schwartz first off? Yeah, this started on Friday when a Twitter user called Zay Squirrel, a very popular account who we don't know who they are, but they, they do quite incredible work and, and they're very well known, uh, pointed out that Anat Schwartz may possess some very extreme anti-Palestinian views as indicated by her use of social media. Schwartz had liked very extreme anti-Palestinian posts on Twitter or X, for example, this one, which calls on Israel to turn Gaza into a slaughterhouse. Uh, Schwartz also liked posts that disseminated the debunked atrocity propaganda hoax about 40 Jewish babies being beheaded on October 7th. And perhaps one of the most significant indications of Schwartz's agenda was a post she liked, which argued that it was necessary to establish a narrative that Hamas equals ISIS in order to basically scare Westerners and, and build support for Israel. A lot of it is very extreme stuff that she was consistently liking. Just liking a post on Twitter or Facebook, um, you know, doesn't necessarily mean you agree with it though. Uh, for example, sometimes we use the like feature in order to bookmark a post for future reference or for research purposes. Um, could there be an innocent explanation for this? Yeah, that, that's possible. And as you said, I often like posts that I don't actually like, but it's just a way so I can find them later if in case I'm writing an article or, or whatever it may be. But that doesn't seem to be the case here. Once mm -hmm. attention focused on Schwartz, she made her Twitter account private for a while, scrubbed it of all the offensive content, and then made it public again. But she never posted any sort of uh, apology or explanation. But more significant, the New York Times itself seems to agree with the criticisms. We sent the New York Times questions about Anat Schwartz and also about the growing controversy over their mass rapes reporting. Unfortunately, most of those questions were ignored, but uh, the Times spokesperson, Danielle Rhodes Ha, did send us this statement. She said, quote, we are aware that a freelance journalist in Israel who has worked with the Times has liked several social media posts. Those likes are unacceptable violations of our company policy. We are currently reviewing the matter. Uh, what else are we learning about Anat Schwartz and Adam Sella? Well, a lot of people are expressing consternation about the fact that Schwartz had never been a journalist before she was put on this very high profile and sensitive story. She advertises herself as a filmmaker and there's no record of her ever having done this kind of journalism. But all of a sudden in November, she pops up as a journalist for the New York Times, one of the world's most prestigious outlets. There's people who, you know, they spend years and years working at... Uh, less prestigious publications hoping for a gig at the New York Times. And here she comes out of nowhere. And the first story she wrote in November was indeed a regurgitation of atrocity propaganda from Israeli authorities. And as for Adam Seller, he's a recent college graduate with no experience on such a big story. Apparently, he was a food writer. And according to the research of podcaster Esha Krish Krishnaswamy, Sela is Schwartz's nephew. So there is a real question here of nepotism and conflict of interest. Yeah. Um, and after her first article in November, Schwartz went on to write the big story on mass on so-called mass rapes with Jeffrey Gettleman and her nephew, Adam Sella, that came out at the end of December. Is that right? That's correct. They published their big story, Screams Without Words, on December 28th, and they claimed that it was the result of a two-month investigation, uh, and they say they interviewed more than 150 people. 
But actually, just a few months, uh, uh, sorry, a few weeks earlier, on December 4th, the same trio published an earlier article with the headline, What We Know About Sexual Violence During the October 7 Attacks on Israel. And it's curious to me that in that December 4th article, published well into their supposed two-month-long investigation, they do not claim to have identified a single victim or really found out anything themselves. Based on my reading, the December 4th article is just another regurgitation of atrocity claims from the Israeli government and other pro-Israel sources, the same claims that they would recycle in their December 28th article. The main thrust of the December 4th piece is to complain that too many people are skeptical of Israeli atrocity claims about mass rape for which no credible evidence has, had been produced up to that point or since. And even this shoddy article contained lies to try to bolster its credibility, lies that the New York Times actually had to retract. As you can see here, the New York Times added a correction on December 8th. It says, Quote, an earlier version of this article misstated the kind of evidence Israeli police have gathered in investigating accusations of sexual violence committed on October 7th in the attack by Hamas against, against Israel. The police are relying mainly on witness testimony, not on autopsies or forensic evidence, end quote. So as we've said all along, and as the Times is even forced to acknowledge here, there is no physical or forensic evidence backing up the mass rape claims. And the assertion by Gettleman and his team that such evidence existed in their article on December 4th was false. Uh, even to this day, there isn't a single living victim who has come forward, and no victim at all has been positively identified. We only have the very dubious and non-credible eyewitness accounts that we looked at in earlier live streams. But what this tells us is that at least someone at the New York Times knew that the team of Jeffrey Gettleman, Anat Schwartz, and Adam Seller was not reliable and was making false claims about the mass rape story. But they would still be allowed to go on and publish their big fraudulent investigation on December 28th. Incredible. Um Ali, we've previously spoken about how the family of Gal Abdush, uh, a woman that they profiled, they built, basically built the story around uh, their article that came out on December 28th. Uh, the family has come out and repudiated, repudiated the Times' claim that Abdush was raped. Um, her own sister, Miral Alter, said that there was absolute, absolutely no evidence of that and that the Times manipulated and misled the family. Um, has more information come out about the Times' unethical practices here? Yes. In fact, something uh, that we missed earlier, and I think is very significant, was pointed out in January by a person who goes by the name Tali on Twitter. Uh, back in January, Yedi Ot Ahranat, a major Israeli uh, newspaper, interviewed a woman who filmed the video of Gal Abdush, the so-called video of the woman in a black dress. This video does not show uh, Abdush being raped, but it shows her body in a position that Gettleman and company claimed suggests she was raped, a suggestion that Abdush's own sister and other family members strongly deny, as you pointed out. But apparently the woman who took the video, her name is Eden Wesley, had to be pressured to release it to the Times and she says that uh, Anna Schwartz and Adam Sello were very persistent. Uh, Wesley says, and this was in Hebrew to Yediat Ahranat, quote, at first I didn't consider it meaningful. I didn't understand how important it was, but they didn't give up. They called me again and again and explained how important this is to Israeli Hasbara, end quote. Hasbara is, of course, the Hebrew term for Israeli state propaganda. So it seems that Schwartz and Sella, who were working under Jeffrey Gettleman, were convincing people to talk to them for the mass rape story by telling them that it would help Israeli propaganda. So the, it was very clear that from that that they had a specific agenda. No kidding. Um, one of our criticisms of the New York Times mass rapes article is that it relied extensively on Zaka, uh, a Jewish extremist organization whose members 
uh, are, are known to have fabricated numerous atrocity stories about October 7th. Um, and, and I understand that there's new information about Zaka. Well, yeah, Zaka is getting more scrutiny, and that's a good thing. Uh, Zaka itself was founded by a man who was accused of multiple rapes, and he, he um, uh, died by suicide uh, when these allegations uh, came out in Israel in, uh, in, in the last couple of years. And other Zaka officials attempted to help him cover up that um, those rape accusations. Uh, Zaka portrays itself as a selfless volunteer organization that recovers bodies from crime scenes so they can have a proper Jewish burial. Uh, but as we've discussed before, that's not what it is at all. Um, the Intercept just published this piece pointing out how American media continue to credulously repeat Zaka's lies, including from one of its key uh, people, a man called Yossi Landa, we've talked about his lies before, even though they have been thoroughly debunked and rejected, even by mainstream Israeli media. Shockingly, or perhaps not so shockingly, the New York Times published a glowing puff piece about Zaka by reporter Shira Frankel in mid-January, and this is long after it was clear that Zaka routinely fabricated atrocity stories that again had been debunked in Israeli mainstream media. The Intercept writes, quote, the Times report on Zaka reads like a glowing portrait of selfless volunteers on a holy mission to honor the dead and give families closure in accordance with Jewish law. The article could also be read as a whitewash of an organization mired in sexual abuse and financial scandals for decades. The Times never notes that Landau, that's Yossi Landau, appears to be a serial fabulist and other Zaka volunteers tell stories that stretch credulity, end quote. And here's a pretty incredible discovery by journalist Aaron Maté. Zaka has a New York advisory board, probably to help with fundraising. One of its members, uh, he's still listed on the Zaka website, is Stuart Seldowitz. He was the former U.S. diplomat under President Barack Obama, who recently accepted a plea deal in a hate crimes case against him. You'll recall the viral videos of him repeatedly abusing a food cart vendor in New York City with anti-Palestinian, anti-Muslim rants. Let's just take a look at this very short clip uh, to remind ourselves of who Stuart Seldowitz is. Why, if we killed 4,000 Palestinian kids, you know what? It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. Go, 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 go. Yeah, so that, that's who's on the, uh, who Zach has selected for, uh, for its advisory board. And I just want to note here that while U.S. media continue to spread unverified and debunked atrocity propaganda about mass rapes and other alleged atrocities on October 7th, they're ignoring the mountain ev mounting evidence, including direct witness testimonies of sexual violence and torture against Palestinian women by Israeli soldiers. Exactly. Yeah, just crickets. Um, other than the statement that we got from the Times about Anat Schwartz, is the newspaper finally addressing the fundamental problems with the Gettleman article at all? No, not yet. Other than the statement we received about Anat Schwartz, and which has also been sent uh, to other publications, the Times has so far failed to address the growing scandal. Ryan Grimm, a journalist with The Intercept, reported that sources at The New York Times told him that the newspaper is now cutting ties with Anat Schwartz after her social media history was exposed. He also reminds us, and we discussed this as well in a previous live stream, that editors at The New York Times' own podcast, The Daily, have been unable to produce an episode of their podcast based on the mass rapes article that Schwartz uh, worked on with Gettleman and Seller because the producers found it to be so full of holes. So there's a risk that the Times will just try to make this about Anna Schwartz and throw her under the bus in order to distract attention from the bigger questions. Who assigned and oversaw the Gettleman propaganda piece alleging mass rapes? Why is the New York Times ignoring the growing internal and external concern and anger over its 
promotion of false atrocity propaganda that is being used by Israel to justify genocide. And remember, this is a newspaper that uses its prestige and cachet to give credence to major stories and has repeatedly used that name brand to push propaganda and lies, such as Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. The New York Times apologized for that, but it has not changed its ways. As long as it refuses to retract the Gettleman, Schwartz, Seller, mass rapes fraud, and to account transparently for how this came about, you can say that the New York Times is only adding to the Palestinian blood it already has on its hands. Indeed. Well, uh, looks like this story just won't go away, so we will keep um, reporting on it and updating as necessary. Ali, thank you so much for continuing to be on this. Um, and yeah, we'll just we'll just keep knocking away. Thanks for watching this video. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hit like, leave a comment. These engagements help us with the YouTube algorithm and it helps us to get around Silicon Valley censorship as much as possible. It does make a difference. You can also support our journalism by going to electronicintifada.net and clicking on donate now. Thank you.